mighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one more, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and descended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We are singing hymn 525, Crown Him with Many Crowns, verses 1, 3, and 5. In 525, verses 1, 3, and 5. Well, 
Why aren't there those cards out there? Because the world has not grabbed hold of Ascension Day. It hasn't converted it into a secular holiday. And unfortunately, we've come to rely on the world to keep us up to date on the church year. So most Christians just let Ascension Day slip by unnoticed because there is not a Hallmark card that allows us to send the very best. So what message would you put on an Ascension Day card if you were a card writer? See you at the end of the millennium. What's that? See you at the end of the millennium. See you at the end of the millennium. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> How about up, up, and away? <laughs> <laughs> oh, with higher balloons on the front. <laughs> or wishing you a cloudy day <laughs> as Jesus ascends into the clouds. Okay, who wrote these? <laughs> <laughs> or how about this one? A picture of Jesus ascending into the heavens and Jesus saying, God to heaven, wish you were here. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the message that would give us hope. Be, yeah. And... Hope is really what we need, and it's what Ascension Day is all about. Hope is very similar to optimism. And when you really find, make a fine distinction, hope is tied to action, where optimism is simply an attitude. So optimism is a passive thing. You just have an attitude. Hope is an active thing. You hold on to it. So, maybe it's like this. Optimism is like having a gym membership, and then you feel fit. But hope inspires you to get up and go to the gym every morning. Now, the opposite of hope is despair. Despair leads to inaction, to guilt, and to fear. I guess that's when you have a gym membership and you realize you're not going. But as Luther writes in the small catechism, when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. We're asking that the Lord would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. So with hope, we're able to move through the day and the year and through life when without hope, Everything just kind of grinds to a halt. So the question then becomes, where can we find a hope that is true? Because a false hope isn't a hope. It's going to let you down in the end. False hope would cause you to live a life that's based on a lie. Many a cult has been based on a charismatic leader. People build all their hopes and dreams around that person, and he turns out to be a fraud, or somehow falls from grace. Many cults have also set important dates, like this is the date that Jesus is going to return for the second coming. Back in the 19th century, that was a really big thing. Uh, the Millerites, people followed a, a, a person by the name of Miller, who kept saying, I calculated the date of Christ's return, and it is this date I think it started out in 1844. When it wasn't that date, he said, I've recalculated. <laughs> yeah, 1846 right. or 7. And then when that didn't happen, it became known as the Great Disappointment. Oh, the comet's gone. And there were the people that uh, the comet the white tech and the people up at Alka with the white hats and all of these other cults that have based their hopes on something that turned out to be false. So false hope comes at a cost. It leads to being bitter or disillusioned. Uh, it can instill bad living habits. Ultimately, might even cause a rebellion against God. Despair and ungodliness. Jesus proclaimed in Matthew chapter 7, A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. False hopes can never produce anything. So Paul ties our hope to Jesus, specifically to his ascension. Because God has raised Jesus, as St. Paul writes to the Ephesians, raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Which means we have a real hope for our future. 
Because Jesus is not gone from us. He has been promoted. And he's taking us with him. When coaches or politicians take a new higher position, they often take their trusted staff with them. Well, that's the case with us. Christ is the head. We are the members of his body. We're the church. And so if all things are under his feet, as St. Paul says, it means they're under ours as well. But unlike top flight coaching staffs or office staffs, we're not trusted because we have a record of achievement. We're trusted because Jesus has called us and redeemed us. He's given us the riches of his glorious, glorious inheritance in the saints, St. Paul continues. It is Jesus who has called us to sainthood by the will of his Father, and it's the Spirit that gives us this wisdom and knowledge. And that's the good news. By Jesus' death, and by his resurrection, and by his ascension to the right hand of his Father in heaven. We know that our sins are forgiven, our hope is assured, and we are due to inherit a portion of his riches by his grace. So we're a little bit different than Jesus' disciples who watched him ascend. We have not walked, talked, eaten with Jesus the way they did in the flesh. But because he is ascended, he's now with all of us. And we can live lives of hope of being in his presence forever. We have this hope, and our world is now hopeful, which is different than the world around us. And every day from that world around us, and I would say most especially this last week or two, we've heard messages of hopelessness. The first hopeless message we've heard over and over again is about the climate changing. We're warned that someday the cities will be flooded, our coasts will be destroyed by the rising of the seas. The last couple of years we've heard viruses are going to take away all of our freedoms and ruin our lives. And in these last couple of weeks we've been plagued with violence and we hear that faith in God is collapsing and people are then taking their hate and turning it into violence to deal with their problems. So boy, the market for hope is wide open. And many are out there in the business of selling false hopes. And we hear these false hopes proclaimed every day. Turn on the television, you'll hear a commercial that says, this pill is going to help you live better. You get advice that this stock or this investment is going to make you rich. Or this party, this political party, or this particular person is going to make everything right. Or this new spiritual practice is going to make everything good. All of these come from wolves in sheep's clothing and they're all around us. But Jesus' ascension gives us hope. You know there is a God. You know that he cared enough for you to send his son to redeem you. You know that his son was crucified. He died. He's now risen and ascended to rule over all things. And he will be with us always, just as he promised. Because ascension does not mean gone from us. It means Jesus is now present at God's right hand. The hand of God's power is what that means. And in all the places he said that he would be, Jesus is in his word, he's in his sacraments, he is among his people. And that is our hope. So, in conclusion, there are a lot of festivals that make up our church here. And we all love Christmas. There's the baby Jesus, the manger, the angels, the shepherds. Easter is special. It has its lilies, and the empty tomb gives us hope. There is the bewilderment of the disciples. Pentecost is the festival that pushes us out into the world and announces that we have become the body of Christ. But ascension is unique in that its central message is hope. It centers our faith. It strengthens us for what lies ahead. And it gives us the promise there 
is indeed a better future coming. That is our hope. That's what Jesus has promised. Now he sits at the right hand of the Father to deliver that hope. Amen. Amen. My favorite hymn, Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Our hope is built on nothing less. Yeah, absolutely. We pray the prayer of the church. The response to the petitions is, Lord, have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the unity of the whole church on earth, that sharing the one faith in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we would bear a worthy witness to the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. That we may grow in the knowledge of God's word and that we may be faithful teachers of that word to our children and messengers to those who are not yet of the kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For all of those who are afflicted in health, that God would give them healing and strength according to his will and sustain them in the faith and that for Christ's sake he would raise them up in glory on the last day. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We begin the service of the sacrament on page 177 with the practice. <laughs> the Lord be with you.
way for us to receive the Lord's Supper this evening will be if I come around to you. So I will come first with the body of Christ, and then we'll come back with the individual cups containing the blood of Christ. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. We may now depart in peace. And now we sing the canticle, Thank the Lord.
Go in peace. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Thank you, God. Thank you, God.